an exciting webinar um, uh, sponsored by the CS10K community. Uh, tonight's topic is CS in the making, and we're going to um, have two wonderful guests for the next hour here with us. Um, our first is James David, or Jim David. Um, Jim is the principal designee and lead teacher at STEM School Chattanooga. He was also the 2013-14 State Teacher of the Year for the Air Force Association. And he has a rich, interesting background um, in history, teaching, and an ed specialist um, in a degree in school leadership. So we're glad to have Jim David here with us tonight. We're also joined by um, Michael Stone. Uh, Michael is an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow at the National Science Foundation, or NSF. Formal high school teacher and Fab Lab director at STEM School Chattanooga. I just love that name, Fab Lab. Um, and his background is in computer science and instructional leadership. Um, both of these gentlemen have put together a wonderful presentation um, for you, and I'm going to turn it over to them in just a moment. Um, I will be here um, to assist in the background, um, paying attention to the chat window. Um, if there is any, if you have any questions or concerns throughout the presentation, I'll be happy to answer those for you. You can also send them to me directly, um, a private chat by hovering over my name at the top under host, and then there's an option to send, um, start a private chat. Um, but if you are, as uh, I mentioned before, um, we do encourage you to actively participate, not just in the chat window, but if you're able to, also um, verbally by calling in, and thank you, Jim, I was going to do that too, but he just put in the conference number for you so you can reference that. If you do call in, we ask you just to stay, to mute your line until you're ready to speak just so that we don't hear the background noise. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to these two gentlemen, and they will take things from here. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. This is uh, Michael Stone, and uh, <clears throat> just wanted to say thank you uh, to Melissa and uh, for having us, the CS10K community. Uh, and as we get started, I am a, um, as, as my title says, I'm an Einstein Fellow uh, with the National Science Foundation, but uh, it behooves me so that our lawyers don't come after me, that I let you know I don't actually work for the foundation. I'm not a federal employee. Nothing I say in this represents the stance of the National Science Foundation. So I uh, apologize for the legal ease at the beginning, but I have to make sure I'm speaking here in my role as a teacher at the STEM school. Uh, and not as a uh, National Science Foundation employee. So with that out of the way, um, I just wanted to set the stage a bit uh, for this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about something that Jim and I uh, had worked on together um, over the past 18 months um, at the STEM school. Um, the STEM school in Chattanooga that we uh, both worked at, Jim is still there, has a uh, fabrication laboratory that is state-of-the-art. If you're familiar with the Fab Lab project out of MIT, um, we were just blessed uh, to, to acquire some grant funding um, and to put this facility in the building. We both came from backgrounds at schools that did not have near this type of uh, equipment. And so we certainly recognize that, um, you know, this level of uh, machinery and automation is not the norm um, in every school. Uh, so we will be uh, talking to you tonight about sort of our, 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 basic, uh, our basic idea is how to infuse computer science um, and really create pathways to computer science uh, through making. So in that vein, um, we, did, we kind of talked about some guiding principles for us when we were thinking about how you um, use computer science, especially in early grades, uh, sort of K6, maybe even K7. Um, there's a, you know, a, a myriad of apps and, and opportunities out there available to use uh, things like Scratch Junior and um, uh, Code.org. There's, a, there's a, uh, just a real... Uh, wide range of uh, applications that are available for teachers and students and families to use in computer science. But what we recognize uh, far too often is a few things. Um, one, there's sometimes an issue with equitable access. Um, they're not necessarily designed uh, with diverse student populations in mind, and that can be problematic. Um, sort of widen this, uh, this equity gap that already exists in, in computer science and gender gap. Um, and the other thing that we, we wanted to be cognizant about is we see oftentimes when we do things um, like Hour of Code, which is, which is super engaging for the students, um, it's sometimes difficult to keep the students engaged beyond that. And how do, how do we, after we get them uh, sort of started coding, how do we get them to sort of stick with it and uh, really, really engage in sort of computer science beyond just coding? So uh, you can read the principles that are on the screen here. Um, basically, here's what we what we sort of built our whole crux around 
um, as we started taking our STEM school students into other schools and trying to introduce coding and computer science at earlier ages, uh, we, we believe, first of all, that connecting coding to physical phenomenon um, really creates a context that not only engages, but creates a deep sense of ownership um, for students. So a lot of times these are unplugged activities. Um, CS Unplugged has a, is a, has a wealth of resources for like, activities that sort of get kids thinking about computational thinking, gives them some relevant context to um, do these sorts of things in. Um, there's, a, there's a wide variety of, op of options out there uh, that help to do this, but we think it's important to connect this uh, you like, connect coding to something physical, right? So that it um, basically it can it can move from abstract and really give some meaningful context to what they're doing in coding. Um, then secondly, um, we want to look at how to blend making and coding um, so that it's more engaging for students. And then finally, this is critical. We believe not just in primary grades but across K-12, but especially wherever the entry point is. So if you're introducing students to um, coding for the first time, even if it's a uh, you know, freshman or sophomore level of high school, um, as we, we often saw at the STEM school, when they came into our classes, this was the first time they maybe would ever program um, or, or even have thought about the idea. Um, we believe it's very important to focus on the iterative problem solving process rather than the outcome. So we say that to say, it's not necessarily does a robust program or application that the students make actually work? Is it completely functional? For us, that's that's ancillary. That's something we want to focus on further down the line. At the onset, we are extremely interested in, um, <coughs> excuse me, at the onset, we're extremely interested in uh, focusing on this iterative problem solving process. Um, and when we say focus on, what we really mean is assess. Right? We want to assess that process because we believe if we're assessing um, the process of problem solving as opposed to the outcome, that it empowers students to um, be innovative in how they attack problems. It lets them uh, feel like they can fail and fix it. Uh, and this is you know, not traditionally how school is done. And then finally, this, uh, we had a little bit of a formatting issue here, but um, if you haven't, uh, check out what Dr. Marina Bears is doing. Uh, she's at Tufts University. I've included the link there on the slides. And um, she's a co-creator of Scratch Junior. And she has some really interesting work if you're in the K K5, K6 space on uh, really even pre-K on um, how to bring computer science in an evidence-based, research-based uh, way to that, uh, that student population. So when we talk about computer science and making, um, inevitably it ends up, you end up talking about stuff. Um, so we wanted to just throw out a handful of options for things that are out there. Um, and of course, running a webinar, it's a little bit difficult to get a feel for your, uh, your audience and, and what everyone is familiar with. So some of these have been around for a while. Um, and I'm, I'm going to step on Jim's toes a little bit here, um, introducing some of these if you've not seen them. But um, I wanted to speak specifically to Makey Makey. So in the in the first slide, that was a, a picture of my my three year old daughter, and uh, we uh, unpackaged the Makey Makey at the house uh, about a month ago. And um, what's really fascinating about that, if you're familiar, if you're unfamiliar with Makey Makey, essentially um, it's a electronic device that plugs in through USB and it allows you to map any um, to, or I should, should say to use um, anything that conducts electricity. So you can basically think anything that has water in it or is metal, um, anything that conducts electricity can become um, a button on your keyboard through this device. So you can see a little picture of the device there. It's incredibly easy to use, very easy to, uh, to play with. And um, what I love about this is, especially for early um, elementary students, you can introduce it to them as a toy. Um, and sort of sneak in the coding. And so we love this idea, really K-12, of giving students the opportunity to sort of play, um, play in a uh, non-intrusive, non, uh, kind of a not-so-scary context. And uh, after they've had an opportunity to play, uh, you could use on makingmaking.com or there's a, you know, basically any, any website that interacts in any way. They can use this to, uh, to play games, uh, Tetris, they can play the piano, they can play whatever. Um, but you can also make you make you suggest, and, and for obvious reasons, this works really nicely with Scratch. So you can very quickly turn this over into a drag and drop um, uh, block-based programming uh, system. And when you use it uh, in, in alignment with that, the, the children still think that they're playing, right? They, they, have this, uh, they have this toy, they're able to use you know, bananas or oranges or spoons or whatever and, and to replace the keyboard with. Um, but they can use Scratch um, or any other block-based programming language 
to start to get the computer to do what they want it to do when they want it to do it. So it um, really gives some, some interesting physical context um, to what's otherwise a fairly abstract um, uh, programming environment. And you can see the rest here. Um, we have some real interest in using Spark at, at, at really across all grades. I've been using this with first graders all the way up through seniors. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's where, uh, that's where uh, Jim is going to go. So the last little piece that we wanted to, to mention is we feel like sort of in this, this rough pathway to computer science, eventually you have to switch from block-based uh, programming to syntax, right? Eventually students have to learn uh, to actually code uh, with syntax, maybe they won't always have to, but right now, this is certainly something that has to eventually happen. So in our opinion, um, prior to switching to syntax-driven programming environments, we think students should do the following. So we think they should have an understanding of problem decomposition. They should be able to write or state a solution as a series of sequential steps, so essentially develop an algorithm. Um, they should be able to demonstrate understanding of how coding impacts the physical world. Um, and we want them to think that computing is fun. I apologize for the typo there. Um, so to do those things, right, to, to instill this sense of awe and wonder, um, we, we feel like connecting computer science to making, um, even in low-tech ways, um, is a great option to consider when you are working to get students um, not just engaged once, right? Not can they get Elsa to complete a task on the screen, but eventually... We want them to see how this can impact their actual world. And so connecting this to real world experience, we believe, is really, uh, really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, I see Grant there. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I think we're probably not, not too far away, maybe not, not far at all away from uh, block-based coding really, really just sort of taking over. Uh, but for now, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Since syntax eventually has to become something. So here I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and he'll sort of pick up uh, at the middle school, high school area and uh, take off for you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple different programs that we are doing with our kids to kind of bridge that gap, going from you know drag and drop over to um, actual you know syntax type coding. And to do that, we're going to show you three different robots um, that we use at our school, and then we have some lesson plans and some things for you as well um, that Melissa will be able to post for you for later. So the first one we're going to look at is the Zero Spark. Um, we like it for lots of different reasons. Um, it plays really quick and really fast with your Android devices or your um, Apple devices. The cost is 129 and what we ask our kids to do is kind of make it a real world and give them like a, a task. So this first one we ask them, how can we as many golf engineers create courses that allow participants to navigate obstacles with serial robots? So I know that sounds kind of crazy, but so what does that look like? So here are some of our kids. And so what we have our kids do is you, we give them the robot. And we had, um, we start for this particular group, we have about 14 robots. And we broke them into groups uh, of three, and we gave them a task. And they were going to create a putt-putt course. So you got 13 different groups making 13 different putt-putt courses. And what they end up using is they can use Google SketchUp to create the course. They can cut off the wood with a CNC router. We ended up having uh, Home Depot and Lowe's donate some materials for us. And this is kind of the prototype stage. So we're teaching our kids about building and you actually use the Lightning Lab app, which is awesome. So the Sphero is, you can drive it on a remote control car, or you can actually code the robot. And so what we were having our kids do is create a course, and then they would have to code the robot to finish not only their obstacle course, but an obstacle course that they've not seen, which would be a neighbor's. And so what they can find the robot can do, I mean, it was just, I don't know, a day into it, and they found out these robots can go through water, and the robots can jump, and the robots can go fast and slow. And so the kids then became engineers and designers of the problems that they could solve with robots. And it wasn't just on a screen. It was, all right, here's a robot, and I have to make a task and then make the robot solve the task I don't know. So we're actually wanting them to go from more just theory to actually going to the next step um, with these particular robots. No questions, I'm going to jump to the next one, and I can always go back. So don't worry if you want to jump in and ask questions. So the next uh, robot we had our kids work with is a Bobot um, uh, by Parallax. And it's 159, and it uses coding. The kids write code in something called Stamp, Stamp Basic. And uh, we wanted them to build these robots. And what ends up happening is they get a kit. 
and we asked our kids and tasked our kids with this, construct and code a parallax robot to successfully navigate an unknown maze. And so these particular robots can actually be coded in multiple ways. Kids can code it to put bumpers on the robot, and the robot goes through maze, and as it bumps, it decides if it goes left or right. There's sensors on the front of these um, for the robot to decide what it can do. It can follow light, or it can um, be pushed away from light. And so these kids will get a maze, and every day we actually change the maze of the particular robot. And we actually have them finish the maze. At the end of it, we have a huge competition for the kids that go through um, mazes that they don't know, and we make a big round robin, we make a big kind of bracket, kind of like a basketball, you know, Sweet 16 competition um, with the kids for the robots. So here's a couple of the kids, and you can see them actually building the robots in the bottom left corner, and the bottom, they're actually building these robots, and then they actually code these robots, and you can kind of see the maze. We just use some real basic wood to make our mazes, and we use the wood just because you can actually just change it uh, every so often. Um, but we wanted our kids to do something, again, almost the same kind of vein, that it wasn't just in theory, it's actually we're going to code it to actually do actual things. The last series of robots that we had was the LEGO uh, Mindstorm NXT robot by LEGO. Um, we're using uh, model back. Um, the, the new ones are a little bit more expensive, the EV3s. And we had our kids, they can actually do the drag and drop code um, at the NXT, and they can actually code the robot as well. And we asked our kids, how can we at Renaissance Fair engineers create fair activities that will allow participants to complete a Renaissance themed activity with NXT LEGO robots? So think kind of like we did with the heroes of the mini pop up course. We're doing the exact same thing with the LEGO Mindstorms. We are having them create challenges that they don't know what the challenges look like. And of course, you can look at the whole lesson plan when um, Melissa posts it. But we want our kids to bring it into reality. So it's the same thing. Kids actually start from zero. Uh, and they actually will build the robot, and they don't know what the robot has to do. And what I like about the, um, the NXT robot is you can put a bunch of different accessories on top of these robots, these Lego robots, and you can make it do a whole bunch of things from grab to push to pull. It can do light sensing. It can follow light and all those other kind of things. Um, so essentially, those are the those are the three major ways that we're currently using our robots um, at our school, and I think the way of using it goes from almost drag and drop to kind of the the real world thing that we're kind of looking at. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So what we are essentially trying to do um, is sort of provide essentially provide students with a a context within which to use coding that um, is perhaps a bit more engaging than just manipulating an avatar or doing something on a virtual screen. Uh, so to do that, right, it, it, you have to, we feel like you have to incorporate some sort of physical um, component. And as Jim alluded to, um, you can, you know, what, what, what we discovered is that it's not just about having robotics or having, uh, you know, all of these, these fancy digital toys, but also um, sort of integrating those toys with authentic uh, problems. Um, so this is, you know, creating a fair or a, a robotic maze or a puppet course or whatever. Um, it really creates a deeper sense of ownership for the students that takes it a level beyond just initial engagement. So what we knew was that, what we anticipated, um, is that we would get some questions in this initially about funding. All right. Uh, where do you where do you buy these toys? Isn't as important as how do you buy these things? Um, so we just wanted to share some tips that we found, and we should probably tell you up front. I meant to to talk about this in the introduction, but I'll just give you a little bit of uh, brief background. Uh, the students that we have at our school, um, at the at the school that we came from, um, it is a traditional public school in the sense that it's ran by the local school board. We have to take state testing. Um, and as far as that's concerned, it's it's a normal public school. The, the biggest difference is that. Um, they bus students into our school from every school zone in the district. So every high school in our district is allotted seats, which are given away on a double-blind lottery. So the application process is essentially name and zip code, um, and seats are given out at a sort of per capita rate. So a, a big high school in our zone um, gets to send more students than a small high school. 
Um, but it really, you really get a wide range of students. So this is, uh, it's, it's a very diverse student population, not just in terms of socioeconomic and ethnicity, but also in terms of just where, where they come from um, in our community. Um, so it's not, these are not hand-picked kids. They're not, they, they don't have computing backgrounds. They've not done this stuff before they get to us necessarily. In fact, many times we have students that are you know, pretty far behind academically and, and have some catch-up work to do. Uh, giving them authentic problems seems to really help with that. And we think this is where computer science is powerful. So on the funding side, we are a normal public school, and we actually come from one of the lower funded school districts um, in the state, uh, in Tennessee. And so with that in mind, I should also say we, we receive the lowest number, of, the, the lowest amount of money per student in our school district as a platform school. That's one of the perks, I guess you could call it, is we get even less money. Um, so what Jim and I did was we started looking for opportunities to, to you know, how do, we, how do we supplement what we, what we needed? So we initially started grandiose and thinking of, you know, uh, NSF style of grants. And we weren't writing million dollar grants, but we were looking for, you know, for $50,000 grants because we had these, these huge plans. What we realized is, number one, you don't have to buy a device for every student. Um, students need to learn to collaborate anyways. So for us, you can see there at the bottom, we started with 10 Spheros for 200 students uh, across three grade levels. And um, that's what we used for our entire first year. I think, I'm not sure, Jim, how many you have now, but I don't think it's uh, maybe 20 or so. Is that right? 18. It's not 18. even, not much more than that. Right. So you're still talking less than 10% in terms of the number of sphero, uh, devices to, um, to students. Um, but it really doesn't present that many challenges. You just have to be a little bit creative. So number one, we realized we didn't have to think in terms of fifty and sixty thousand um, dollars. Number so what that did for us, it made us instead of looking for these gigantic national grants, we started focusing on uh, local and regional mini grants. Um, we won several um, five hundred dollar to between five hundred and five thousand dollar grants, um, and that really helped us uh, quite a bit. Um, and yeah, as Jeff is suggesting there from PEF, they do, uh, they do go on sale and you can, you certainly can get them for cheaper. And also, um, we found, we've had quite a bit of success talking with, um, <coughs> excuse me, just contacting these companies, letting them know what we were doing. And I can say Sphero in particular is super interested in working with, uh, schools and education. Um, not just because they feel like it's a hot market, but they genuinely care and, uh, just contact them directly and find out if they can work out a, a discount plan with you. And that also helps you in the grant writing process if the grant funders know you're, you're getting a reduced price. Uh, mm -hmm. And then finally... Yeah, and I'm going I, I to... one thing about Sphero? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kim asked something about elementary ideas for Sphero. I would definitely Google the Lightning Lab for elementary ideas. So I just want to throw that out for her. No problem. I think I sent a link over in the uh, chat window as well. Oh, um, for the lab. Mm -hmm. um, so then the other thing we found to be really successful um, is sometimes stuff just falls in your lap. So the Lego Mindstorm robots that, uh, that Jim was showing, we actually didn't purchase those. Um, those literally fell in our laps and it was because of Jim's passion. Um, his passion for what he was doing was so loud um, that people in his public learning network knew um, that he was interested in this. And what happened was that... Um, oh. As he was just, just constantly talking about this, we had a local business that had some of these and were just not using them anymore. They were old, and they just gave them to him. Um, so, I mean, that's a little bit serendipitous, but certainly I, I think it can't be understated that um, being as vocal as you can, and that certainly helps with crowdfunding as well, uh, can help you do this sort of thing. So uh, with that, I think we'll open up the floor for any questions. If, if there's any questions out there, we'd be more than happy to... Uh, to help point you in any direction that you, you may need. And if there aren't any questions, um, if we would love to hear from, I, so I don't, we don't obviously don't know our audience particularly well here, but we would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts about this. Um, just um, if you can, if you have done anything to connect computer science and making, and uh, maybe any successes and/or barriers that you bumped into while you were doing this. It certainly is not a uh, not something that's an exact science for sure.
Um, Mark, I'm not sure. Low, low level literacy. I'm, I'm not sure what the OS is. Oh, uh, Jim, do you have any? Uh, take yeah. On this? So I was going to say, like, we yeah, we make all of our kids do it, and I, I think um, when as a teacher, when you start coming up with crazy creative ideas, like. Pup Pup Course, uh, we did the, the Medieval Renaissance Fair, and when you just start thinking of crazy stuff, what ends up happening, I think it's just for all kids, is they just kind of jump on board with it. And some of our kids, you know, let's go with the ELL, for example, when you start off with drag and drop code, that's great, right? Because you're not having to read. All you're doing is drag and drop, and you can manipulate a computer when you might not be able to, you know, the language or have those literacy skills for the low, those particular low learners on the other end, the low learn, uh, literacy people. Right, and Mark, my, my initial reaction was to think of things like using Scratch and Makey Makey uh, because it's very, um, very limited syntax. Uh, I can just, I'll tell you personally, um, doing this with my seven-year-old daughter, she is uh, not, she's a little bit behind in terms of where she should be in terms of her reading level. And um, so to help with that, that, that was sort of where we turned uh, we wanted her to think about to start developing some problem solving skills and some computational thinking. And uh, what I love about Scratch is that you can you start to sort of understand from the icons what's going on. So you can really get into computing and manipulating uh, some physical phenomenon um, without having to have a uh, you know a high level of reading, uh, like a high grasp of the English language. Um, I don't have direct experience with English language learners um, and using computer science, um, but I could. I think that there could be some opportunity here um, because of the drag and drop nature, especially as Jim said, of, of block-based programming, um, to maybe overcome some of the barriers that would be there traditionally. Uh, also, I'm Mark, I'm also recommend. Mark, you might want to check out work uh, from. Uh, uh, I'll have to pull up his name. Go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, uh, also, when you get a chance, when Melissa posts our lesson plans, I would definitely look at um, how we're using uh, for English class and what we require for all English kids to do. So the um, one of the, the Bobox robots, we make them actually do per subject. So the lesson plan up there that says ninth grade um, unit five robotics, should be, you can probably see that now. If you pull that up, you'll actually see there the, the component they have to do for math, science, English, history, um, and science for every piece. And you actually see in that one that kids actually have to create a use manual. So regardless of their level, what it ends up doing, it gives them a tactile, fun, something to interact with. And then the English teacher comes alongside of it and says, here is something we expect you should be able to do. And they can use pictures, and they can put it in their own level of wherever they're at. So it actually gives them an opportunity to practice technical writing at whatever level they're at. And Mark, uh, the guy I was going to tell you, you might want to look at some of the work that Andreas Stefik has done um, out of uh, UCLA. Uh, he's really, he's a, he's a recent uh, White House champion of change in computer science. Really interesting work with computer science. Um, he's, you'll, you may see at, a, at a, just a, a, a glance at his work, you'll see he does a lot of work with accessibility for um, special needs. Uh, but he's also uh, has some real significant research in terms of how syntax-based programming languages are designed and the rationale behind them. I think that could be an interesting carryover into what you're talking about with ELL. And yeah, Grant, thank you. I forgot about the FOOS. That's awesome. Uh, the FOOS is a, would be a great option, uh, absolutely. Uh, Grant, are you uh, available to talk? Could you speak to that for, for a bit? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, Mark, so if you check out Andreas Stefik's uh, page on the uh, UCLA, uh, if you just Google Andreas Stefik in UCLA, uh, you'll find his contact information there. Um, so he's obviously, he's pretty highly sought after right now, especially after the White House Award, but he's doing some really neat work um, in, in just he's researching and he and his wife are actually developing a new language. Um, they've discovered that I don't want to, to try to summarize his work in, in a couple of sentences, but basically 
uh, as, as a terrible summary, they've discovered that a lot of the syntax is like how Java, how HTML, how you know C++, how all of these uh, programming languages were developed, um, that the rationale behind them, you can actually develop as effective of a uh, language uh, by literally rolling dice and pulling uh, keywords from a chart. Um, and so there's, there's essentially almost no rationale um, in terms of the, the design of the languages. Uh, so he's, he's looking at thinking about how that's done in a way that uh, could really op reduce some barriers uh, across a lot of mediums for ELL, special mean? needs, whatever. Yeah, is that Grant? I don't know. Um, can, uh, for the participants, maybe somebody can respond in the chat window. Can you guys see um, the files on the left side of your screen? Can you download the, can you see those files available for download? Fantastic. Yeah, so I, Mark, I probably shouldn't say that they're not, that there's no rationale, but there's, there's, it's as if there's no rationale, right? That, that you can practically design just as effective a language uh, at random. So that's kind of interesting. I think someone was trying to talk and I cut you off. I apologize. No, sorry. It's Grant. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just super quickly, the FOOS is a, um, you know, learn to code resource design uh, primarily for K through five, although we have kids up through middle school using it. Um, what's different about it is there's no words at all. So we've gotten tons of anecdotal feedback that for ESL, ADHD, and other you know, disabilities related to learning or to reading issues, it's been particularly great. Um, and then we have a, a short hour of code um, curriculum that's free that's been translated into 18 languages and then a 10 lesson curriculum that's free that's uh, in English. And the, the two parts of the game are kind of puzzles introducing concepts and then the cool part I think is where you can make your own video game. And that's what the kids get into, and you can program uh, everything in your in your game. So I'm Grant, not that's trying to turn that awesome. into a commercial. <laughs> no, no, I, I really appreciate. It. I didn't realize that you were with them. Um, I, are you with Spark Fun? So uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Code Spark. Which or is Code Spark. Spark. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. It Code Spark, which is the company that makes the foods and. I try to jump on as many of these as I can just because it's really interesting to hear what educators find useful. No, that's, that is awesome. I've, I haven't used the foods in an educational context, but I use it with my daughter several times. So yeah, I, I could say uh, as, a, as an unpaid uh, solicitation, I, I think it's awesome. We really do. We really like it in our household. So. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I'm a big fan of all the tools we've been talking about. I mean, you know, in our mind, uh, the more people who code with whatever it is, the better things will be, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll mute for... myself. Thanks for letting me jump in. Oh, no problem. Thank you for jumping in. And, and uh, again, I think we have about uh, 20 minutes technically left. We don't have to drag this out indefinitely. But uh, if there's any other questions or anyone else wants to um, jump on, feel free to uh, unmute your mics. And we could, we'd love to make this a discussion. Viswick. Uh, Simon, I don't know what Viswick is. I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you'd like to uh, hop on the mic. I will say while we're waiting, um, so I think what we're kind of seeing here, while we wait for Simon to get his uh, mic activated. Uh, so I think this is, I was having this conversation with a colleague at NSF today, I think this is an, an interesting part of the challenge in, in computer science, right? Um, I was a former math teacher and taught, a, taught AP calculus at the high school level. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, you know, with math, it basically hasn't changed in, in a long time, right? So it's not a particularly dynamic field, even though it opens up some dynamic opportunities. It's not ex extremely or exceptionally dynamic, especially in the K-12 arena. Um, but what we... Uh, what we see in computer science is what's happening here, right? That it does change very quickly and it is incredibly dynamic. So sometimes it is very difficult um, to uh, know all these tools. So uh, with that said, Simon, we'd love to hear uh, what you have to share. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. All right. 
Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, you haven't heard of Biswick, but you probably have a lot of languages that are based on it from 20 years ago. Uh, Biswick.com is a data flow programming language that uh, has been developed over the last 10 years uh, in Canada and is now going into the United States. And it's based on a data flow paradigm uh, combined with a social network and a um, app store. So it's basically a way for teachers to bring in uh, computer uh, science and computational thinking into classrooms very easily uh, and at, at the same time uh, bring um, uh, aspect of entrepreneurship uh, to students who are in high school. So we focus on grades 6 to 12 specifically where most of the tools do not and uh, enable kids to kind of think of uh, building mobile apps uh, after Scratch and after App Inventor uh, and do it in a way that uh, is sort of more of a professional level development environment. And uh, it, it, help, it really helps teachers. I mean, the, the biggest problem we find in bringing uh, technology to the classroom is not the technology itself, but it's really the enabling, uh, enablement of uh, an empowerment of the teachers to be able to do that uh, who are not necessarily computer scientists at all. So that's what uh, MISVIC's about. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, feel free to share a, a link to your work in the uh, chat window. We'd love to, people to have access to that. Sure. Thank you very much. Great. Um, and we had a question from, um, let's see, a question. It seems CS courses in schools are mutually exclusive for making. Um, how do you convince the decision makers that robotics and making should be inside the curriculum rather than after school? So uh, that's a great question, and I'll, I'm going to say, just uh, up front that Jim and I were incredibly fortunate to have a, um, <coughs> excuse me, to have a principal um, who was phenomenal at um, this innovative thinking. So that was a hurdle we didn't have to overcome. But I think what, 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 I, what we can say to help you make that argument, um, we try to connect anything that we're doing um, to actual gains for the students, mm -hmm. right? So for that, it's hard to assess. It's hard to assess and identify. I mean, nationally, researchers at leading universities are are working on ways to to connect. Uh, you know, to say that computer science creates help helps contribute to gains in in algebra or or whatever. That's that's not a, an easy problem uh, to solve. Not not an easy link to make from a research standpoint. But um, what we do think you can do at the K twelve level, especially, um, is go is to help you sort of fight this fight is to focus on, uh, again, focus on the process. So does every, is every gonna student gonna be a computer scientist? Probably not. Does every student need to really have all of these making skills? Maybe not. But um, the authentic problem solving, the critical thinking, the collaboration, the creative problem solving skills um, that are innately developed when computer science and making are fused into uh, the curriculum sort of holistically, um, those are have undeniable implications across all subject matter. So it becomes a computer scientist isn't computer science and, and making don't necessarily need to be a standalone component that they really can impact what's happening, you know, in math and science and whatnot. And there, Jim just shared a uh, a, a link. I think Jim, go ahead and talk about that. Yeah. So this is um, we we put together a bunch of different lesson plans that integrate cross curriculum. That actually not every single one of them has computer science into it, but a lot of them do. So as you kind of go through it, you'll see some different ones where we did one with video games, and you'll see some ones where we've asked kids to redesign using digital art to recreate um, modern art pieces, things like that. So I think like maybe seeing some examples to take to an administrator and be like. This is how this fits, like giving kids more than just like, all right, solve this triangle. It's more like, all right, this is, we can actually create something to show kids why solving the triangle is important and or why, how does writing fit with that. So I posted that particular link. You can take a whole bunch of look at them and you can see the different ones. And of course, you can contact Michael or I afterwards and kind of want a deeper, like, how do you guys do that or what does it look like, you know, post product? Um, we can help you out with that too. Not about the end-all to end-all, it's, uh, it's just ideas, right? So what you're going to see there is just a bunch of different ways in which we do um, put them together. 
<laughs> and yes, you just summarized that uh, much better than I did out loud. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> and just so everybody knows, uh, the, the, the STEM school that we came from, that Jim is at, uh, for the state associate, is considered a platform school. So a component of that is that they have to um, they have to share the resources. They're supposed to be innovating and then publishing. So they, they publish practically, I guess, Jim, all of the unit plans are online. Is that correct? Yeah, so we have our unit plans, and then this year our goal is to start posting our uh, individual mini PBLs. So that list continues to grow and get ed gets edited every single year. Things we find better as we get feedback, we continue to tweak and change it. But again, you know, the whole philosophy of one plus one equals three, my idea plus your idea comes up with a new idea. So if you look at our ideas and you already have an idea how you want to do something, hopefully our idea plus your idea comes up with a whole new idea. And as soon as you come up with a new idea, share it back with us so you know we can turn it into something too. So Yeah. And I will say too, speaking back to sort of the dynamic nature of this field, um, one of the things that we believe is, is incredibly important in this process is we spoke to it briefly earlier about the um, the iterative nature, right, and, and focusing and really assessing the process for students. Um, that's a lot easier to do when the students see the teachers trying and failing and working through iterative processes as well. So I can say that with a great deal of clarity for Jim and, and myself both, um, there is a lot of these, a lot of times we throw these out there, start these PBO units with the students and um you know we fail miserably and they have to they watch us work through this process of redesigning and, and evaluating um, and it's great to help the students you know, it, it's great to help them see that um, it really creates a culture in the school that says we're we're about improvement we're not about uh perfection and uh we really think that that sort of uh, that's speaking a little bit to some education reform stuff not just computer science but i think that comes directly from what happens inside of uh effective computer science education um, individually as well. Can I answer a question that um, Jeannie just asked? Absolutely. Uh, it was a question about Arduinos and, and Raspberry Pi. So my answer is yes. So going back to the idea of the presentation, so we, we want to create, create a bridge for all kids to get confident and get them started. We do have kids that are on the other spectrum that come to our school with like they're all about it. So we actually have kids that play with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. I got a group right now that is taking a Raspberry Pi and they're making an interactive mirror with it. So I also teach a, one of my STEM classes is letting kids come and do their own projects. And then I have an Arduino group that, um, this is going to sound nerdy, but it, it's my kids. You got to know them. They built an Arduino that when you walk across the motion sensor, it shoots a Nerf bullet at you. And um, they were it was just kind of a play toy they were creating. So the answer to that is yes. Um, but typically, the, the robots we have that we show in the presentation are kind of the intro. We want we expect every kid to do that so that when they jump to an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, it's not as scary. Like they don't, oh, we have to code this, got to rewrite this. I've done this, something like this, so they can scaffold up. And I'll tell you that we got the Arduinos and the Raspberry Pis almost the same way, right? Which was going and finding a little mini grant. The nice thing about Raspberry Pis and Arduinos is they're fairly cheap. Yeah, and I will say if you're new to Raspberry Pi Arduinos, the one thing to be uh, cognizant of there, uh, the individual components in those are cheap, and for the most part, they can be standalone. Uh, but just be conscientious. I've been uh, working with the middle school in Arkansas, and uh, they invested a couple thousand dollars in Arduinos, or sorry, in Raspberry Pis, uh, but they purchased no sensors. So if you are looking into getting into this microcomputing, uh, microprocessing uh, world, just be cognizant. Uh, that's maybe a topic for a different day, but be cognizant that in that world, you're going to need to save some of your budget or be considerate of uh, the cost that will be involved with some of the peripherals that are likely needed with those as well. Uh, Jenny, why would you like to move away from the Lego EV3s?
Ah, I, I'm assuming you mean propriety and programming language. <clears throat> gotcha. Yeah, I kind of agree with uh, the second part if you're referring to expense. Um, what I did with my kids is the, we did a renaissance fair, and in the stations that we had the kids to do, they didn't have to be built out of Legos, right? So um, they, you know, you saw some of the photos we had where the prototypes for the spheres were made out of cardboard and stuff. The goal was still the same. The goal was to still get kids coding. So we didn't make everything had to be per se Legos. It was more like what can we do with what we have. And yes, Kim and Jenny both, uh, you know, anyone else that's on that's in this boat, uh, you, you two have at least have, have spoken up here. Um, I would say for both of you, it sounds like you're, you're both pioneers to, to echo what Simon just, just typed. And uh, I encourage you to participate yeah. in as many of these things as you can and, and be a voice. I think it is. it will take time to change the culture, but if we can show this is happening successfully in pockets across the country, um, you know, uh, changing... Education is a big task, but if we can just get teachers on board, that can be a start, right? And eventually teachers that are on board will become administrators, hopefully, um, and be able to, to really lead lead from both the front and the back. But kudos, it, it's not easy, especially if you don't have a supportive administration. Uh, Uh, Jeannie, I'll tell you, the, actually, the, the main reason uh, we got our robots was from a group that hosts uh, the first Lego League. And the reason we got the older robots is they don't use those um, for their league, for their prototypes, for the judges and stuff. And that's where we were like, hey, you're not using them anymore? We'd love to house them, slash use them, slash borrow them, slash take good care of them. Um, so that was part of my, you know, as Michael said before, you know, in your own personal learning networks, talking to people and almost just making those kind of request things. Well, we'll leave it open, I guess, for about a couple more minutes here. If anybody has any other questions, it's like we got one more person typing here. Questions or comments, feel free to just chime in throw your comments out as well. Uh, Jenny, I totally understand. Uh, I, that's always a um, a fun challenge, right? But um, we seem to see this be in pockets that same way that you're either involved in making or you're involved in CS. We don't see a lot of infusion of the two, but the reality is the academic gains from both of them are unbelievably similar, uh, as we spoke to earlier. And um, that being the case, we think that there's a high opportunity here to, to sort of leverage the two and, and uh, really... Uh, that's 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 what Jim did uh, this year with with his uh, Renaissance Fair and those sorts of things. We we had the making in place, and uh, we realized you can really stick that in there with computer science. And uh, oh gosh, and yeah, 3D printing uh, hope, opens up a whole other can of worms. It does. Uh, um, I think Simon, the the slides are going to be emailed out. If you'd like to have them emailed, Melissa earlier in the chat put her um, email address there. You can email her. Um, we're having a problem getting the slides to upload properly. Sorry, Jim, I think I cut you off there. No, you're, you're good. Um, you know, I was thinking there's other programs out there, too, that I think work really well with STEM and, you know, computer science. And um, I'm a huge fan right now. One of the programs we're using for our, you know, serial group is we're having our kids create, you know, um, Google SketchUp stuff. Right, so they're having to draft it kind of, and then they're actually taking it over a CNC router and actually running it through a computer. I think there's a huge integration, like you were saying, Michael, between the two. And I think, I think though, there's some can be some easier bridges to kind of bridge that gap between the two of them. Absolutely.
I'd also mention crossing that gap in terms of just connecting computer science across curriculum. Um, if you didn't, if you weren't on previously, uh, I don't know, it's probably a month and a half ago now, um, but I would imagine, Melissa, it's in the archive somewhere. Um, Emmanuel Shanzer did some amazing work with Bootstrap, is, well, I should say is doing some amazing work with a program he calls Bootstrap that he developed um, that leverages computer science and, uh, or sorry, uses computer science actually um, to, to teach algebra. And it is really interesting. Okay, there, he's coming up on the 29th. I didn't know that. Uh, it's fascinating work if you're at all interested, especially in the eighth or ninth grade space. It's great, and he's actually developing Bootstrap 2 now to, to work on the new AP Computer Science Principles course, um, which is another phenomenal uh, thing to check out. So um, give a little shout out there. Gonna... I, I was... Go ahead. I'll shout out back that up. Uh, our Algebra 1 teacher actually um, has run that for about three weeks and absolutely loves it, and the kids love it. Great. Ah, oh, thank you, Brian. Ooh, the CS for All program. Um, <laughs> that one's one that could, uh, I've got to be a little careful how I answer that one. Uh, Jim, what would you tell principals about CS for All? Um, uh, it's coming. <laughs> it needs to happen. And... Um, I would think get involved sooner than later would be my, I, 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 I know you, see you can't exactly speak for it, but that's my two cents on it. Yes, I mean, I guess what I can say about it is I think if I were talking to principals, um, what, what, what is public, right, is that the, the president just made a very uh, audacious announcement with this and what he's talking about with, uh, with CS for All and, and what he's putting in his budget, you know, he mentions $4 billion in his uh, proposal, budget proposal that he'll be sending to Congress. Um, I think it speaks to, regardless of what actually gets funded, I think it speaks to um, the importance, right, that there is there's national recognition at the highest level of how important computer science, delivering computer science in an equitable way to every student in the country, that that, that has become a, it clearly has become a priority. And uh, so if I were talking to principals, I, I think that the question is, why aren't principals on board? Um, there's a great, if you haven't seen it, I, I'm sure you have, there's a, there's a great uh, little bit of research done through a Gallup poll this past summer um, that referenced um, who is essentially, essentially asking who's interested in computer science. And basically, everyone thinks that computer science should be in K-12, with the exception of principals. Um, so it might be interesting if you have the opportunity to ask them, why don't they think computer science is important? I would love to hear their input on that. Hi, everyone. This is Melissa, and I'm, we're happy to continue with questions, but I would, do want to put a plug in for that third bullet there that um, we are doing our... Um, February uh, CSNK Twitter chat around CS for All and kind of thinking about what are the hopes and dreams and challenges of it are going to be. Um, I do want to note that we've pushed the time back an hour because we were competing with the EdTech chat, which many of our folks also wanted to be a part of that as well. So if, um, if you're able, we do hope you'll join us on the 22nd. All you have to do is follow the hashtag CS10K on Twitter and join in the fun. Um, and there are three different webinars that we do have coming up later this month as well. It's a busy February. Um, I put a, a link in the chat window and I'll link it again. Um, it's a publicly available CSNK community. is a is a virtual community space that's open to everyone. It was primarily started for the support of the CS10K projects that are funded by the National Science Foundation. But it truly is a community that's open to everyone. And we've started to do things like this that go beyond just the project work in support of um, uh, teachers of, of computer science or teachers that are just interested in, in computer science. So um, there's lots of things to see and do um, and as part of the community and we hope that you'll stay connected. But I did just want to go ahead and get those plugs in there. For those of you that have um, asked that uh, I send you the PowerPoint, um, I've tried to reduce the size of it so that it would make its way out of my inbox, but it's still, um, it's still saying it's sending. So just know that I do have your addresses and we'll get them to you for sure. 
Um, but um, in the meantime, are, are there any other final questions for Jim or Michael? This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. But any final questions? They, they both have been excellent in sharing ideas and information. Well, thank you guys for having us. This is wonderful. And uh, we are, I don't think either one of us consider ourselves experts in this field, uh, but we're certainly just working to try to learn and get better. And these are great opportunities to have some targeted discussions. So we really appreciate you uh, participating and uh, making this a collaborative effort. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, we'll keep the line on um, for a while in case anyone does have anything individually they'd like to ask. But if not, we hope to see you on the CSNK community. We thank you so much.